Um, and you can face, or wait, actually, you got it, okay. So um, I'm a neuropsychologist, okay, and I've been working in the Valley for about a decade. I have uh, the Seren Centers, and we've got four Valley locations. We do a lot of neuromodulation and neurofeedback. We do EMDR therapy, we do developmental pediatrics, integrative care, and um, also we have learning disability clinics, and we remediate dyslexia in summer intensive programs. So we've been around quite a while, way up in northwest Peoria, and we just expanded to the Arrowhead area, Tempe, and Scottsdale. So um, just wanted to let you know that's who I am. If you've ever seen that logo, this is the, the face behind it. And um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about EMDR therapy. So um, for those of you who are not EMDR trained, or for some of you who are but don't use it, there's a quote-unquote controversy about it. And really, it's really interesting what kind of gets embedded in what people think and just becomes sort of, you know, urban legends, like that we only use 10% of our brains. Have you heard that? That's absolutely not true at all. You use your entire brain, maybe not all at once, but if you look at an EEG, everything's always moving. It's not like one part is on, one part is off. There's movement all the time in the brain. But people just sort of believe this. And one of the things that happened with EMDR therapy is way back when people would compare that to cognitive behavioral therapy. And CBT had good outcomes, right? So if you can get an 85% uh, rate of improvement with CBT and then another therapy comes along and it's trying to prove that it's better, it's really hard to get that statistical significance up above that 85%, okay? But um, really, EMDR is better. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry to tell you that, but don't worry for those of you who are like, oh great, great, now I gotta pay $1,600 and go to two weekends of training and do all that. No, you don't. What I did was I actually took a component out of EMDR so that you can actually use that in whatever modality you're doing, get a nervous system reaction reduction, and that'll make your work more powerful with people no matter what modality you're using. Okay, so don't, don't stress out about that. But, um, thanks. But, um, and, and here's where I'm doing, I'm not just saying that because I, I'm an in-group, out-group bias person and I tend to like EMDR. Um, the World Health Organization only recommends two treatments for trauma. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. Two treatments for trauma. Trauma-focused CBT and EMDR. No benzos, no antidepressants, okay? No doing million-dollar research where we're injecting somebody's, you know, nerves and blocking out their memory networks, okay? Two treatments. And what is the difference between trauma-focused CBT and regular CBT? Anybody? You're writing and you're reading, which is the Katagai movements. Okay, and every, for those of you who don't know what EMDR, part of it is bilateral stimulation. Either what I have in my hand right now is tactile, where I'm getting, um, getting vibrations back and forth, and also eye movements, okay, back and forth. These change your brain and work in networks that are non-conscious networks that control your stress response, okay? And so if you are working with anyone with trauma and you're a CBT therapist, that's amazing. I hope you're using CPT or I hope you're using a trauma-focused CBT because anytime you add writing, reading, bilateral stim, anything like that, you're making it multimodal. And what do we know about multimodal treatments? They hit more of the brain centers and they're more effective, okay? So um, there's off-label use, and I won't cover that, so we can go ahead and, and do that. The contraindications of EMDR therapy, um, there's not many contraindications. Sometimes the bilateral stim will cause dissociation, but EMDR isn't just eye movements. It's actually an eight-phase comprehensive system of therapy, and when it's done right, sometimes you don't even use eye movements until somebody's been, you've been resourcing them and getting them more stable for like a year. So a lot of your population, your SMI population, your populations that are very, very traumatized and don't have a lot of resources, um, you won't actually ever get to eye movements um, in, in the course of therapy or it will take a very long time. So um, just know that it's more than just eye movements. There's a lot of therapists, I will have people come in and say, oh, I did EMDR, and a therapist is just talking to them and kind of waving their fingers in front of their face to see if it'll work, and that's not EMDR. It's an eight-phase comprehensive therapy, okay? So here's the thing that we use um, EMDR therapy for at the Saren Centers, and notice it's not just for PTSD. If you've been reading the literature and taking courses, you know that there's an association of EMDR and PTSD, okay? Um, that's how it originated. But really, desensitizing the nervous response and reprocessing memories can work for anything. So if I get a five-year-old with um, a couple of phobias in my office and has a supportive family, do you know how many sessions of EMDR it takes to get rid of those phobias? One. 
It's that quick in somebody young. If it's a 15 year old, it might take me three or four. But for little kids, they process this so fast when you're desensitizing their nervous system, it really is a miracle. And this isn't just me saying this, you don't need to believe me. You can go to the literature and find that it's very well documented that in single incident PTSD with EMDR therapy will remit 100% in, in an average of six sessions. Okay, it's better than 12 to 24 everybody, all right? Okay, so we've talked about EMDR therapy and it's based on the adaptive information processing model. And this may be different than some of the other models that people are used to. You know, we all kind of think, why are you stressed out, right? Well, I must be thinking about something stressful. You know, not necessarily. Haven't you ever been stressed out and not known why? Hasn't your stomach ever been sick and you can't, you, we go backwards and try to attribute it, okay? But a lot of times we don't know. The networks in the brain, if you think about, go back to Freud and the old iceberg, right, where there's just a tip and then there's all this stuff underneath, okay? He was right about that. There's so much underneath. There's all these really powerful networks that you have zero idea what they're up to, none. And you have very little control. And I'm gonna demonstrate that right now. So what I'd like you all to do is just take a deep breath. And you're gonna hold it until I say to start breathing again. Wah, wah. <laughs> Who started breathing again already? Right, why? Aren't you in conscious control of that? Can't you just willfully stop that autonomic process? You can't, and why not? It's because there's an override switch in your brain, right? There's overrides for autonomic processes that are really not in your conscious control. This is why you can't commit suicide by um, not breathing, okay? So um, we'll, go to the next, we'll go to the next one. And when you go into your memory networks, your brain is always deciding what to do. So just even personally, a lot of times, I'm sure none of you this falls under, but me sometimes. Do you ever do anything you didn't want to do? <laughs> do you ever eat something that you're not, you shouldn't have eaten or drank something you shouldn't have drank? No, it's just me, right? Okay, why is that? It's because these decisions that you want to be under your conscious control are really, that system is not very powerful in the face of habits, memory networks, all of these things that are kind of underneath the surface, okay? And so your brain's always going back to what it does, what it did before, and if we can create hacks, let's say you're in an elevator and something stressful happens. What happens the next time you're supposed to go in an elevator? That gets locked into your fear system. And what happens is your fear system is supposed to make you be afraid of that, and then you start to avoid. What gets locked into your fear system will create avoidance, a lot of avoidance, okay? And if we can unlock it somehow, then you won't avoid things. And there's always reasons why we go move towards and away for things, and a lot of those aren't, aren't conscious. And so EMDR takes into account a three-pronged approach of past events, current distress, and then imagine future events. Because a lot of times we want to avoid things that our brain is just telling us might be bad. And for those of you who are a little obsessive, or you have patients, or people you work with that are a little obsessive, that what it, part of their brain is really, really active. What about this? What about that? What about this, right? And we tone that down, and then they're not avoiding future imagined things, okay? So the advantages of this kind of therapy is that people don't even need to say what they're stressed out about, okay? And here's the thing when you're working with patients or you're working with people is, I get that you don't want to talk about what happened to you. You don't have to. I can literally put, uh, give somebody these, have them do the eye movements, go through the eight phases. They don't even have to tell me what they're upset about. And every time for the therapists in here who, know, who stop and say, what do you notice? All they have to do is say stuff, and it will still work. I have tried this on 50 plus people over the last decade, and it still works. The point is to go into their verbal systems. It's not necessarily that they have to say it. So this is great for implications like police officers or um, spies, right, CIA people and things, because they can debrief with therapists without the therapist having to have clearance. It's kind of a really, really cool thing. Okay, and I'm not gonna go through so many of the phases, we'll skip through these, but the first phase is just history, where somebody takes someone's history. The second phase is preparation, getting trust, and doing, explaining the therapy and how it's gonna work. The third is assessment, which is actually getting people's targets. And here's how we do, here's how we help people now overcome stress. And this is good for everybody. You know, I'm talking a lot about therapy in the first part of this talk, so bear with me if you're not a therapist. But if you think about your life, we can pretty much make anything that you've already been through not feel stressful when you think about it now. 
okay? And so we get targets. So let's say I think about the fact that my 10-year-old last night, and I'm not making this up, um, woke up at midnight and snuck his computer and woke me up playing a video game, right? So I'm up in the middle of the night and I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty ticked off, right? If I'm upset about it, um, I can actually process it very, very quickly in EMDR, and that's what's called a target, and get me to not be so upset about it. Because I'm going to handle it regardless. You don't have to be upset in order to handle situations. In fact, if you're too upset, what happens? You go into the wrong nervous system and you can't make good decisions. You're triggered. Okay. So we also get um, a feeling and body sensations because immediately when you think of something stressful, and you can try this right now if you want to, you'll get a body sensation. So my good friend here, we just did this, and I didn't know what was upsetting him, but I said, think of something stressful. And it was about a five out of a 10, and I said, where do you feel in your body? He could immediately feel it here and here. Okay, and you can clear out those body sensations very, very quickly with what I have in my hands that I'll show you, but there's always a body sensation, and when you get that, you know that you're moving along into that wrong nervous system. Okay, all right, phase four is desensitization, and this is really, really important. So there's, we've got these gadgets, okay, and some of them are old, kind of wired and things like that, and actually it's not, oh, go ahead and show the next, the next slide. There we go, thank you. Um, we had this old technology, that worked somewhat, it was better than nothing, and therapists started to realize, hey, when I'm not having these little tappers here on the left, that gray and that black thing, they would buzz back and forth. And the therapist started to figure out, you know what, when I'm in between sessions, I just like holding these. They're doing something, right? And, but they were part of this big system. And for those of you who are therapists, you know that getting trained in EMDR is just kind of a, a daunting thing, right? Um, so what I did was figure it out that just this stimulation back and forth without any other therapy, without anything else, can actually lower nervous system reactivity. And so we improved the waveform. Um, we have it as app controlled, so therapists control it with an app. And now we have a new one that doesn't even require an app. And so I'll demonstrate this in a little bit, and you can actually try it. And where's, actually, where's Mariah? Can I put you? Oh, she's got, I waited till she took a big bite. So she actually has these. And this is where, for something for everybody, she can talk a little bit about how you just use these. Forget being therapists or anything else, but how you want to be using these just in your regular life. right now. I'm just going to hold this up. And so they can be kind of difficult in the car. And so <laughs> Shock. I'm just, shocked by this. Let's just say that. And you know what? And honestly, it can be very stressful. And so for me, I was like, I got to do something. You know, I've given them iPads. I've given them, them things to color. And so I got the buzzies to see if they would help. And they did help. And then I learned they can help me too. <laughs> so not only are they helping my kids be less stressed out. Um, and you know, sitting in a car for 45 minutes is difficult for a three or four year old. Um, and so also for me, I, I've used them in very um, intense meetings with very important people where you know you can get kind of nervous. I've had them on, nobody's known I had them on and I was able to be calm, cool and collected and get to my, you know, express my points. And so I'm a big fan. Thank you, thank you. By the way, this is not a huge sales pitch, but, th but thank you for that. Um, it's just to illustrate that, you know, we're kind of, we've got a few groups of people here today. And um, besides using them in the therapeutic context, this is, you know, this is can be relevant to you in your life and relevant to you if you're interfacing with people in general, okay? You can just hand somebody these and in about 30 seconds, the statistics are that it'll calm uh, about, take tone about 71% of the stress down. And now I'm too far up. Okay, all right, back. Yes. You can't buy them on Amazon, but you can buy them online, and um, and I'll I'll give you a web I'll share a website with you. And by the way, um, I think do we have a sign up sheet? Did you do we have a sign up sheet up there for emails so that I can email you all this presentation if you'd like it, or we do? Okay, I'll get your information. You will get this presentation. We just don't want to print out you know 150 copies. Um, so the interesting thing too is that when your nervous system is calm, okay. You're thinking, you're rational, you have capacity for joy and empathy, and when you're in fight or flight, none of that is happening, okay? In fight or flight, we're selfish. Our thinking brains are shut down. We can't make good decisions. And here today at Aurora Behavioral Health, 
there are a lot of patients and a lot of clients here that everybody in this room is working with that really cannot regulate their nervous system on their own. And have you ever tried to talk to somebody when they're really upset, like a child, and be like, just calm down? What? Or your spouse or your partner. What happens if they're upset and you tell them to come down? Does that help? <laughs> do they get more angry with you? Of course they do, because if they could calm down, they would. Just like if you could have not, if you could have not started breathing again, you would have, because I gave you a direction and you, you, know, and you wanted to like, do that test, but your autonomic system just turned it right back on. There are forces outside of your conscious control, and when you're not in control of them, we need, kind of, we need some physiological and some neuroscience hacks to help out. So in the installation phase of EMDR, what happens is people get rid of um, their negative thoughts about what the situation happened, their nervous system reactivity, and then we build them back up into confidence and a better sense of identity. And that's an important part of that process too. Okay. And then we also, whenever you're working with somebody, or um, you'll know if you're even out in the field, if there's any EMTs here or anything like that, if somebody's heart is racing, or somebody has a stomach ache, or somebody has a headache and they're stressed out, they're not calm, okay? They may be telling you they're calm, but they're actually still in fight or flight. So therapists will always check and make sure that those, the body sensations are clear as re they relate to a stressful event. Okay, phase seven, I'll skip that. That's just closure, and then eight, we make sure that things are, things are already done. Whoa. And that's it, everybody. See you later. See you later. <laughs> that's OK. We'll go back. Here. Here, I got it. OK. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, good, here we go. Okay, all right, we're back with caution tape too. Oh no, all right. Um, okay, so does anybody have any questions so far about this? About EMDR, eight phases, anything like that? Yes. PC, positive cognition. So if somebody has a traumatic event, well, like, like me, let's say this wasn't really traumatic, but last night my kid is doing that. What if I started to think, oh, I'm a bad parent, okay? When I process that, my new adaptive thought could be, I do the best I can and I can learn from this, and then you build back up that positive cognition. Was there a question over here? So I noticed that you're wearing it on your wrist. You don't have to hold it in your hands. You don't have to hold it in your hands, and that's a good therapy question. So these are modular. And so what you can do is you can actually wear them on the wrists. And here's, here's some, there's some cool discoveries with this. One is that you don't have to have them in your hands. The other is they don't have to be touching your skin. And the other is they can be anywhere on your body because of the general effect that goes, routes up through the somatosensory cortex. So, yes. Yes, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna skip through this and I'm going to get right into that because, um, okay. So we'll talk, about, we'll talk about these now. And here's a cute little girl picture for you. Um, can someone come up and be my volunteer? Come on up. Give her a round of applause, everybody. <laughs> OK. What's your name? I'm Karen. This is Karen. And Karen, what do you do? Um, I own a transitional living home for women with eating disorders. Awesome. It's a nonprofit. Just opened it. So. Awesome. What's it called? Karen's Transitional Living Home, but with a C-A-I-R-N-S. Like OK. It's a rock pile when you go hiking. Well, thank you. Now, it's ner is it nerve-wracking just being up here? Mm. Or are you really comfortable? Because most people just coming up here, it's kind of like a stressful thing, and then we can just pop woozy. these on. Little woozy? Okay. <laughs> so where do you feel that in your body right now, the fact right that you're up here? Okay. And how stressful is it right now, 0 to 10? Um, at like a, well, what's... Like from what's zero, 10? 0 is no, no stress whatsoever, uh, and like 10 a, is like the worst thing. Like a 3. Okay. Can you think of something a little more stressful? Um, driving okay. <laughs> in Arizona. Driving in Arizona. And when you think of that, is that a three or is it higher? Uh, that's, right now? that's probably yeah, like a, wow. <laughs> okay, that's like a big a one. Okay, a seven. And did that, that just got more intense, right? Yeah. And how intense is that now, zero to ten? Um, like, a, like a seven still. Okay, so you can hold these. Okay. And here's the thing, therapist, I want you to pay attention, okay, because this is where the magic happens. You don't need to keep thinking about it. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have you look at this little girl. Mm -hmm. 
and try to figure out like how old she is or something like that. Here is a stress paradigm changer I want you all to know in your personal lives and working with people is that you don't have to actively process stress cognitively for it to go away. Okay, I'm going to tell you that again. You do not have to actively, consciously process stress in order for it to go away. What we do is we give a, a neuroscience physiological hack. It doesn't take that long to work. It creates a new memory network. And what does your brain do when it decides what to do the next time? It goes back into the last thing to figure it out. That's adaptive information processing. So how's your stomach? I like didn't even realize I was standing up here for a second. OK. <laughs> like, OK. Is it gone or is it down, yeah, like zero to 10? Yeah, I like just went over, that's really. It's weird, right? This yeah, is why I like I, people to do it, because it's hard to explain. That's why I asked about Amazon, I mean, can I? Yeah, can I sure, I'll tell you. How stressed out can you get about that now, about driving in Arizona? It was a seven, like, and immediately, yeah. and here's this. You've got a network, there's several networks involved, but one of them is the salience network, and what it's doing is whenever there's lights and sounds and all these things. It's actually processing all of that and deciding in milliseconds what to do with your stress response. Do I go into fight or flight or closer to that? Or do I stay in, uh, you know, do I go into the calm system? So immediately with a thought, an internal thought can send you into fight or flight, right? An oh no thought or a what if or thinking about trauma can send you right there. So thinking about driving, she was already over onto a seven and 10 is like really fight or flight. And now try to get it to a seven. I don't know. No, it's not there. It's not there. Okay. Now, here's the thing. It's it, really weird. It's, uh, yeah, it is. I know, sorry, I know. It's mind blowing right yeah. now. Okay. I've never done this, so. Good, good. I'm glad. Mm -hmm. so, so, this is a new experience. So, um, what happens is that it is a distraction, and some people will say, well, okay, but that's fine. You just distracted yourself, right? So, if I'm upset and I go watch Saturday Night Live or something and I'm laughing and whatever, I think about it again and I'm just as upset. So, hand these back to me, okay? So, now they're not. And this is, I need like a rabbit too that I pull out of a hat. Okay, so now try to get stressed out about driving in Arizona and let's see how high we can get it up to. Like zero to 10. Okay, yeah. How high does it go? Um, it doesn't really go as high as it did before. Yeah, so, so it's not gonna take away all of it, right? We still need therapy, we still need all these things, but. What number would you give it, just off the cuff? I don't know, I would say like a three or four. Like a three or four, okay. And here's the good thing, and I'm gonna have her call me tomorrow morning. When she wakes up tomorrow, I'm gonna have you think about driving in Arizona, and it's still gonna be a three or a four. Okay, thank you. That's awesome. Okay, no, thank and you're, you. gonna feel, you're gonna feel good too, there's a residual. So it's not, thank you, so it's not just that your, your attention is orienting, and here's the thing. Just like I'm saying, you don't have to actively, consciously process stress for it to go away, you also, don't, you don't need to try because the networks that are in control of your stress response are not your language networks, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? I know it's unbelievable, I'm asking, I'm flipping some things on its head, but the people who are in the room who are EMDR therapists, you actually know that when you leave somebody at a subjective unit of disturbance, so let's say somebody comes in at a 10 and you're working them down in therapy and they leave and they're at a seven, what do they come back at next week? What's their subjective unit of disturbance? It's seven, it's lower, it doesn't ever go back up, does it, unless they have OCD or something, right? But it doesn't go back up. And there's this ceiling effect of the desensitization that happens where you get it down and then they leave and then they come back and you get it down. But if they have these in between appointments, they're not gonna come back at a seven. They're gonna come back at a five or four or three. And you can actually clear out body sensations before you even start working them. Did somebody else wanna try these really quick? Yeah. It depends on the person. So the question is, when do people use these? Do they use them all the time or only when they're feeling stressed? And it really depends on how dysregulated their nervous systems are. If it's somebody with borderline personality disorder or an autistic child who's constantly going into fight or flight and they're very, very reactive, a lot of times they wear them all day. But if it's somebody, you know, like me, who I, I'm not underlyingly very, you know, terribly anxious, but there's stress in my life, then I will spot use these in stressful situations. Like I had them on before the talk and I'm holding them now and staying, you know, very calm when the, the, when the thunder came and when we weren't setting, the, you know, all of that. I'm not getting worried about the time. I'm just sort of in the moment and I know that things are going to be handled. But if I didn't have these on, I would have been more stressed out. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. So here's what's happening in the brain with these, which is kind of cool. So see this up here? 
this, this is a voxelated view of the brain. This is really cool. We can get EEG data now and read 80% of the brain's pyramidal cell activity on an outpatient basis. Okay? And we can do it in our clinics. It's very, very cool. And it doesn't even, it takes like 15 minutes. Okay? And the caps now are dry, so you don't have to even gel people up with all that goop and everything. So the, on the left is a 38-year-old CEO, um, and that's excess beta activity. And beta is a kind of a fast wave in the brain, and it's associated with anxiety. So we get a baseline, tell them to think about something stressful, and then we put these on for 30 seconds, and then we, we run the EEG and we take edits. And the one, one on the right is the reduction in excess beta afterwards. So using EEG and quantitative methods in neuroscience, we've actually been able to isolate and figure out what alternating bilateral stimulation is really doing. And, um, and then this is the research down here. See these graphs? They look pretty good, right? The before and after. This is self-reported stress before and after 30 seconds. And the average went from 7 point, I think it was 7.5 in that sample. This is a sample of over 1,000 people. 1,000 people! And it went down to 2.5. So basically, just what happened to you, you went from a 7 to a 3, total typical response um, to just having these, not talking about it, not doing therapy, not doing anything. And so if you think about the way this may change your life or the pe patients you're working with, you know, what if you had something that at any time could just calm your nervous system down? And I'm not talking about Merlot, okay? I'm not talking about Xanax, all right? And I'm not talking about anything else that might have any kind of uh, you know, negative consequences. Just something that you push a couple of buttons and it can do that for you. And this is why I think this is so important to share and I'm so glad you're here today. Yes? So the question is, why don't we use our, this on our GI as coming back for post-traumatic stress disorder? It's really interesting you asked that. It's a great question. I was doing some overseas consulting for a while, several years ago, and one of the questions that was posed is, how do we make sure that nobody gets PTSD? And this was my solution. Because if you're desensitizing the nervous system in real time after a single incident, that incident doesn't get embedded in the amygdala um, and the memory systems of the brain, and you're actually preventing. We also know from volunteer work, does it, people of EMDR, anybody ever done HAP, Humanitarian Assistance Program? What the volunteers, amazing volunteers, and what they do is they go into, you know, villages. So there's just something that happens, you know, civil war, and they'll go into a village, and they have to, they do EMDR on entire villages. And what they know, what they have documented is that one therapist and a couple of helpers can do a group of 30, 40 kids at once, at one time, okay? This is like a, va this is basically like a vaccination against PTSD almost. Not only do you relieve the stress and you relieve the disturbance from what just happened, you actually then the next time it happens, you're inoculating these people against future PTSD. You're making them more resilient. It, I'm telling you that it's a miracle and it's a great question and we definitely need to do more. I don't know where we get this whole chronicity model of healthcare that everybody's gotta just live with PTSD, like you own it. I own my anxiety, oh, I can't sleep. I have anxiety, I have PTSD, it's like a part of me, it's not. It's a part of the way that your brain is operating right now that's not natural, that can be undone in most cases. Now obviously if somebody has severe brain injury or some kind of a really, really chronic medical condition, I'm not saying that, you know, that everybody can you know, walk on water and things like that, but for most of us, okay, we are really not doing a great job of working within the constructs of what's possible and even as clinicians, you know, when I've got somebody that's done, and no offense to people who are psychodynamic, because I've seen some miraculous things happen, but like with panic, if somebody is in psychodynamic therapy for panic, and they go in, and three years later they're still having panic, I'm like, what the heck? This is, <laughs> this is not, this is not, um, this is not the model that we should be using for this, because panic is totally curable. It's nervous system dysregulation. Okay, and we're getting all caught up in consciousness and personality and all of these constructs, and it's really about the networks of the brain and the physiology of the body, and when we can actually work with that, we can get, we can get real results. Okay, so don't take my word for it. Here's some research. This was a really cool study in Japan, and it's just taking this and trying to have people think of a positive cognition, okay, a pleasant thought. And what happened was, they, it was an oxygenated hemoglobin study, and, what, and that's, uh, oxygenated hemoglobin is actually a biomarker of stress, okay? So nobody can, you know, self-report is always 
a little bit shaky because people can self-report because they want to please you or do whatever. But biomarkers don't lie, do they? Biomarkers are really like, this is really what's going on. Just like the EEGs don't lie. No one can really fake their EEG, okay? I'm reading something that they may not want me to be able to read. So the oxygenated hemoglobin, actually, um, they showed that when they used this, it showed increase in that and a decrease in wide bilateral areas of the prefrontal cortex, and it helped people recall more representative pleasant memories, created emotional regulation, induced comfortable feelings and pleasant memories, and they're saying that, that just using this alone is warranted, okay? And that was just last year out of Japan. There's other research, too, that shows, and I'm going to come up here. Oh, I can't read it from there, sorry. Um, that um, normal memory retrieval is actually enhanced with this. Okay, so we've got people taking the SATs with these on. Not only because they're not going into that. When you go outside of the performance curve, it's, it's bad, right? You know that. If I was really, really nervous up here, I would have said, um, about a thousand more times and be a little bit shaky, right? But... Um, tests is a big thing. How many people know tests and then they go in and they bomb? We've had people come into our clinic that can't pass their boards and it's just anxiety. They more than know the material. But if you're not anxious when you go into certain situations, you can perform in these situations. And golfers love this, right? We don't have these in waterproof yet, so golfers can use them, but swimmers and other athletes can't, but they can just leave them on the whole time. And it's actually desensitizing you the entire time that it's on, okay? Um, and so the other one is just they found that, because um, people will say, there's a couple questions. Okay, well, why can't I just, why can't I just tap myself? Or why can't I just buy a, a sorry, but this was, has been a question a million times. Why can't I just go buy a cheap vibrator and hold it in my hand, right? Or a massager or something like that. That's always a question I get. It can't be unilateral, it doesn't work. And it can't be continuous. If it's not alternating, or if it's alternating very slow, or if it doesn't have a certain vibration. I've done this, this is like a decade of work into these little things. It doesn't, it's not gonna work very well. Now, if tapping yourself is better than nothing, let's say you don't have these and you wanna cross your body here, and this is called the butterfly hug that people teach people in trauma therapy with the kids, okay? But if you're teaching the butterfly hug, couple of things. It has to be fast, okay? This is too slow. What happens in between this is your body sets out and you're nodding your head, you know this already. Therapists who've been doing this figured this out. Um, if they're doing it too slow, what happens is it doesn't, um, your brain seems to have time to kind of set off the sympathetic uh, activation again. If you're a therapist, EMDR therapist that taps your patients, and there's other therapies called EFT that, that does this, okay, don't do it with one hand, okay? There's too much of a gap in between the taps. Do it with both hands and make sure you have a breath freshener in, okay? Because, right, because there's nothing worse than like your patient's anxious and you're like, doesn't that feel great? Don't you love EMDR, you know? But that's how they teach it, right? This, this allows you to have a nice, safe distance. Also, it's not rhythmic enough. Your brain, is, it responds better. It's more calming when things are rhythmic. They're a little out of sync, then it's jarring again. So this, it's really, really hard to, you know, to get that rhythm. Okay, next slide. Okay. Um, the amygdala is like everybody's favorite brain part other than the prefrontal cortex. Everybody's like, amygdala, it's your amygdala, it's your amygdala. Sorry, I'm Leah and I had to talk about the amygdala before. The amygdala. I, I, my name's Amy. I like to call it the Amy G. Dalla because mine was, used to be pretty whacked out before I did neurofeedback on myself. But um, what it, it's not just your fear response, okay? Think of what the amygdala, ha what has to trigger it. Sensory information, right? And by the way, we've done um, studies with blind sight lesions, which means people that can't see in one hemisphere. And if you put a fear stimulus in the area that you know they can't see, their amygdala will still react. So now we think maybe it doesn't even need to pass through the visual cortex, okay? So these senses, the senses that we have are very, very important in orienting the fear response. And that's why even when you have an internal thought, I mean, you could be sitting here and the first thing I opened up with is EMDR is better. And you're like, oh my God, I don't do EMDR. That could have just made, made you upset with me, made you not feel good, whatever. But then if you had these, you just turn them on and then you would like me again, it would be fine. But, <clears throat> um, but also what they found is that alternating stimulation actually depotentiates the stress response in the amygdala. I got it.
Okay, so it actually depotentiates the fear memory systems. Okay, whoops. Oh, no, I'm in the wrong spot. Okay, there we go. All right, here's, um, here's EEG data. So this is really, really cool. All right, what we can get on an outpatient basis on the left, all these, there's, I know it's too small to see, there's all these numbers. Every area of your brain is like a little Broadman area. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, right and left hemisphere. And then this shows all of the different brain activity, you know, delta, theta, alpha, all the brain waves. And this is the left, and this is the right. And I don't have, oh, this might have a laser on it, actually, that works, if I can point. Ah, oh, look at that. Okay, so see this green right here? And then see this green right here? See that big, huge spike in delta activity? So what I did when I was trying to figure this out is I consulted with one of the fathers of neurofeedback. His name is Joel Lubar, and he's at the University of Tennessee. And he's the one that figured out in the 1970s that neurofeedback could actually be used for ADHD. And now it's a first-line treatment. The American Academy of Pediatrics puts neurofeedback and medication in the same category um, for treating ADHD. Did you know that? I bet you didn't because there's no huge drug industry promoting that fact. But um, neurofeedback is in the same category of treatment as medication, okay? And so I talked to Dr. Lubar and said, hey, I have an EEG and then I did something and I have another EEG and I want you to tell me what's happening, okay? And he goes, what did you do? I'm like, I'm not going to tell you. I just want you to tell me because I think I'm thinking about this right, what this is doing because I think what I did should, everybody should be able to have access to and I want you to tell me what it did. And this is what he said. He goes, I'm seeing significant effects here, an overall lowering of the amplitude of the EEG, reduction in fast wave activity, and he goes, huh, I think he might have said by golly, but I can't remember exactly, and he's, he's a little bit older, but he said, look at that right insula, whatever you did, I want it. And when I told him what he did, I did, I couldn't believe it. And the right insula, by the way, does anybody know about the insula? The insula is really important in integrating sensory information, but it's also really important in addiction. When we look at brains that we know are prone to addiction, their insulas are blown out in certain wave activities and are often way, way away from the norm. And we can look at EEGs, by the way, and cluster people and say, you know what, this kid, even when I look at some EEGs with kids, I can say, you know what, this kid is addiction prone. Like my kid who wakes up in the middle of the night to sneak technology, right? And Dom, who, sorry, I'm gonna call you out here. Dom is my director of applied neuroscience. He actually does neurofeedback on my son. And, um, he, he's, I'm like, what'd you do? And he's like, singulate, 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 because my son is actually compulsive. And if I don't fix his brain right now, he will probably be addicted to something in the future. And I'm trying to prevent that. Yes. So I remember hearing you say this. I'm thinking, like, could this possibly be used for epilepsy? Oh, that's great. Great question. Yeah, so epilepsy. So neurofeedback is actually in the 60s. How it came about, this is actually kind of a cool story. Um, Barry Sturman at UCLA is a, uh, he's a neurologist, and he, they were doing stuff with cats and like training their EEG, their sensory motor rhythm with operant conditioning, okay? So basically getting cats to press a bar when a tone went on and went off, and they're doing all this stuff, you know, with conditioning. And then they thought, well, what if we could just look at the EEG and whenever we want to reinforce that, we'll give a cat a reward, and let's see if we can just train their EEG, and they could. The cats don't need to know what they're doing. Just like, by the way, your dog, your dog doesn't know that you want him to shake his paw. But what you do is you go through a certain series of clicks and reinforcements and you train the brain. And that's all that neurofeedback is. It's operant conditioning, okay? It's a beautiful thing, but it works. And once you're conditioned to do something, that stabilizes, okay? But you have to do it the right way at first. So they, they used operant conditioning, and they changed these cats, this certain rhythm in their brain. And then, sorry, this is a little morbid, they put them in a study, a NASA study, to see the effects of seizure activity of jet fuel. So how much jet fuel do cats have to be exposed to before they, they have seizures? Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't do the study. I didn't think it wouldn't pass an IRB today. Um, and the cats that actually had been through the first, train, the sensory motor rhythm training, ruined the study because they had a two times greater seizure threshold. In other words, they could withstand twice as much exposure before they would go into seizure activity. And so, again, there's no drug company, pr company promoting this, but neurofeedback is one of the top lane treatments for seizures as well. And you can uh, oftentimes reduce seizure activity. And we do have cases where um, kids have been on, you know, Neuron and all these things, and then they're seizure free, but we get their EEGs and they're actually not. They're still activity, and you can train that out with neurofeedback. Good question. Yeah. Go ahead. Here. It's right here. 
And then that's OK. OK. All right. More of this. We're almost done. You're going to get all this. So if you're really nerdy and you want to read about the locus ceruleus and saccadic eye movements, you can. But I think some of you just um, threw up in your mouth and fell asleep. So I'm going to go ahead <laughs> and move on here. Um, so all right. So we're going to talk about the four minute mile. OK. Um, and we're going to get, we're going to have lots of questions. I'll have, you know, I'll be able to demonstrate this on you. But I want to talk to you about uh, the four minute mile. Can the four minute mile be run? Yes, it can. OK, you've already, did you read the slide and you're still not answering my question? OK, I know it's after lunch and you had a lot of carbs. I understand. Um, OK, so Roger Bannister is a neurologist, OK? And he just felt like running on his lunch breaks. He really just wanted to be a neurologist. But because he needed to be efficient, he started doing something called fartlek, OK, which is actually speed play, which is interval training. And because he was doing it a little bit differently, and because he wasn't thinking in terms of limitation, he knew that he could run a four-minute mile and that it could be done. Now, at the time, around the like, start of the 1950s, people thought Everest could not be climbed. People thought there was no way any human being could ever run a four-minute mile. OK? Um, and here's what happened. He actually ran that in the 1952 Olympics, right around the same time Everest was being claimed, b climbed. And, bef and since then, over 4,000 people have climbed Everest. This statistics is from a few years ago. And then uh, 1,300 people had run a sub four minute mile. OK? So here's what happens. We think something can't be done, and it can't. And then what happens? One breakthrough, right? And then we know that it can. And now it's happening and happening and happening. And we have another milestone. And in the book, The Four Minute Mile, he said, no one can say, you must, not you must not run faster than this or jump higher than that. The human spirit is indomitable. Yeah, I love this, not only because he's nerdy and a neurologist like, and in the same field, but because um, I feel like we're at, with our neuroscience today, and not just with what I'm talking with, to you about, OK? We are really only limited by some of our thinking and some of the things that we think can't be done. And if we're limited in our thinking, then we're never going to, to try to go beyond that and try to penetrate some of the things that are really holding us back, not only for ourselves, but for the people that we help. So I just want you to think about, you know, right now, OK, there are miles and mountains. And I want you to think about in our field and with the people that we work with, there are always things, things that I haven't thought of too. What Everest and in our field are we denying are climbable? What four minute miles are we saying can't be run? I don't want anybody's goal to be cope or managed with something. Sometimes people have to, but when I get patients in my office and they say, I just want to learn how to cope with my anxiety, I say, I don't. I want to get rid of your anxiety. You'll still have stress in your life that you can manage, but I don't, want, I don't want you to cope with your insomnia. I don't want you to cope with this. I want it to be better, and we can make it better, but we need to do the right things. We need to think about this and work with this the right way. Okay? Um, I want to challenge you, too, for if you're a, a practitioner, too. We've got this thing in our field, and other fields are like this, that if you don't study it, or if this isn't the thing that you're doing, there's some in-group and out-group bias. Oh, well, that doesn't work. Have you done the lit review? on it because I can promise you there's things that I have said don't work and two years later I stick my tail between my legs and I go wow whoops and I have learned the hard way to not do that because there's always every field every kind of therapy even you know cognitive behavioral therapy that is still evolving EMDR is still evolving psychoanalysis is still evolving neuroscience and neurofeedback is still evolving a couple of years ago I would have had to use a couple of electrodes to train people's brains and now we have 19 channel and I can get to 80 percent of the pyramidal cell activity and train like thousands of things at one time and instead of 150 sessions we can do the, do it in 20 or 30 that's amazing so this field and everything that we're doing, and even human evolution, is really, really um, elevating. So I just want to lift that bar a little bit and have you think about, what am I saying can't be done with myself or with my patients or with the people that I work with? And, and how can I just open that up and maybe consider another possibility? Um, and then that's it. That's all I have for you. Whoops. So. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm ha yes, questions? Yeah, I'm just wondering with the idea that um, if you use the, the alternate
alternating uh, rhythm. Mm -hmm. Can could it ever be misused where people, the army, the armed services, train people to do this before they kill, or or a murderer could use it and then not be tense when they go forward? So, so the question is, can this be misused? Like, can the army use it for people before they go kill? Um, or somebody before they go, you know, they go kill someone, can they use this to like calm down, right? First of all, if somebody is planning a murder, they're probably not all that anxious about it because they're probably a psychopath and they've already, their nervous system is very, but, but you know, here's, here's my thing is, I mean, yes, the military probably is already, you know, will use this to calm people down uh, before they go do things because their performance will be better. But, you know, but the question of wrong or right in that is, is, is a whole other thing. The, the bottom line, though, is, is if somebody is not in nervous system dysregulation, if someone doesn't have road rage and then doesn't cause an accident, or if somebody calms themselves down before they are planning a murder, they might actually be able to think through consequences and then not do it, right? But, or, and, but what if they did it and used it to be able to pass lie detector tests? To pass lie detector tests? Okay, so lie detector tests are... If somebody used this to pass a lie detector test, first of all, whoever's putting it on would be able, you know, to detect this. Um, I don't know if somebody could, somebody could probably actually pass a lie detector test if they had these on. So for those of you who are, want to be in the FBI, uh, if you try this, let me know how it goes. I mean, I think anything has the potential to be misused, but it's not misused in terms of the, the, mis the idea of misuse is in the judgment of what somebody's going to do. What I am interested in, in calming down people's nervous system reactivity, because negotiations go better. There's more, actually more empathy when you're calm. All of those things, when we're more in our thinking brain, okay, and I think our current president is a good you know, example of this, where he's quite often sympathetically activated, and if he weren't, I think things would go a little more smoothly no matter what he was planning, if that makes sense, right? So, yeah, yes. I was going to ask about the findings you found Good in question. the GIs, uh, Marines, and I have a lot of friends in PTSD, as well as wearing the effectiveness of when you work in social so the question was, when I was doing the consulting for the groups that were overseas, you know, and GIs and, and them using this and everything, um, I think the biggest problem is that we're not creating, you know, we don't have we're making too big of a deal of you've got to, you know, go and de go to Germany and get drunk for two days, okay, and then come back and then, like, try to reorient and then all of that fallout and then maybe go to the VA four years later when you're drinking too heavily and you're divorced and all these things and you still have PTSD. If we are treating things in real time and even teaching people how to desensitize other people in real time right after critical incidences, and not even critical incidences, think about our police officers, okay? They are hypervigilant whether or not something bad is happening because it might be happening. And our predictive part of our brain is still part of our fear centers, right? And so, you, you know, and this is, this is why they get to retire after only, you know, 15 years, but that's still enough to wreak havoc on their nervous systems. So the general principle is to desensitize your nervous system in real time, not desensitize so that you're cruel, okay, but desensitize it so that you're not in fight or flight and that this doesn't trip up your fear system and make it overactive because an overactive fear system is responsible for 80 to 90% of the terrible things that happen in so this you world. Make you make a better decision. And that's why this works on cravings, okay? If I'm stressed out and I come home and I feel like, you know, gorging on chocolate or whatever, but I put these on, I actually am more engaged in my thinking brain. And if I still do it just because it's habitual, I actually don't get the same reward, right? Has anybody ever had, like, if you drink, have a glass of wine and you're stressed out and it's really, really good, but if you're not stressed out, it's not a big deal? The reward ratio of whatever it is you're doing, gambling, substances, doing something you know you're not supposed to be doing, it's different depending on whether or not you're stressed out. So if you're not stressed out and you do something, like if I, you know, binge eat, let's say, okay, then I am actually not getting the same reward. And what does my brain do the next time it thinks about binge eating? It goes back into the memory networks and say, well, what happened last time? And it wasn't that rewarding. So you can put behavior on an extinction curve easier with these. And those of you who work with people with OCD, if you're just doing exposure therapy, use these during exposure therapy. Because what happens is, if someone starts out a nine and you're like, get in the elevator, <laughs> you know, and then we're gonna calm your nervous system down, how are you calming their nervous system down? That, that anxiety takes a long time to go down, and if you can cut that time, do it, and then you get a better outcome. Yes? I was EMDR trained, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, and I'm wondering if this has changed, because they said 
short sets is to lock in the cognition, and if you leave it on longer, it processes. I'm not hearing any of this, so maybe it's so beyond that. So the question of EMDR is short sets will lock in a cognition and longer sets process. What they're talking about is when you, start, when you start EMDR therapy, you actually resource people and you have them think of like a calm and safe place. And you use this slowly and for short bursts, just four or five times back and forth. And then you have them take a deep breath. And that actually increases positive feelings. But when you're in active processing, you do longer sets while they're thinking about it and you do it with the eye movements too. So that's kind of, um, that's that distinction. But this, but the difference between using this in EMDR therapy and just using this is you don't need to be thinking about anything for this to be creating calm, okay? So I don't, I'm not thinking about trauma right now and this is calming me down. I'm in a situation that I would normally be nervous in and I'm actually not nervous because I have these on and I'm not even orienting to these. These have been on the whole time and I don't even notice. They become like white noise. So you don't need to be paying attention for this to actively be working. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, is there a limit to how often somebody should use this? If somebody thinks they need it all the time, what they're telling you is, I'm frequently in nervous system dysregulation and I need help, right? And some people think, you know, and, and so that's where it's kind of on an individual basis. The average user, so we've got about, um, we've got thousands of these around the world, okay? Um, they've been out for about eight months, and so we have all the app data coming in of when people are using them, and the average person uses them four times a day. Okay, so stressed out CEO, wakes up, puts them on while they're getting ready, and they have clips on them, which you saw Leah wear, so they're clipping to your clothes. And what you do is you just pop them on, and then you're getting ready, doing whatever, and instead of freaking out about all the things you have to do today, you feel less overwhelmed, okay? Then you go, go to work, and you're in your meeting, and you have to do you know, negotiation or something stressful. Pop them on either dur right before or during, okay? On the way home, get home, house is a disaster, whatever else, put them on so you don't yell at your kids and then can't stop your thoughts before you go to bed, 15 minutes before you, before you go to bed. That's kind of like a typical white collar example of, you know, of, how, of how to use them. And I, um, I did a three day sample and I used them 17 times between myself and my kids because there was this bug flying around and it was huge and freaked us all out. And so passing them around, desensitized, everybody went to sleep that night. You know, there's all kinds of cool situations. Yes. They don't have timers on them, but they will. So these are controlled by an app on your phone um, with pre-settings, and the app is free. So it's, you can go to the App Store and get the free app and check that out. But it's, um, they are controlled by pre-settings, and we are adding functionality to the app all the time. And the next thing we're going to add is a sleep timer, because people who, wanna fa who fall asleep with them on want sometimes to use them in the morning without having to recharge them. And so we, we will add that. And then we're coming up with a special therapist app so you can do, you can store um, not, uh, not protected health information necessarily, but you can store your patient's subjective units of disturbance. You can, um, you know, write a note about which target they're working on, and you can actually count how many times, uh, you know, using the eye movements. You'll be able to use the eye movements with these now, and you'll have, it'll be a complete therapist tool as well, as well as a uh, help a consumer product. Yes, in the purple. How does it help with chronic pain? Do you have chronic pain? Would you like to try it? Okay. Do you feel it now? Okay. How hot? How hard is it now? How intense is it now? Zero to ten. Okay, it's a four. Okay, hold this and hold this, and I'll check back in with you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the question was, how does it help with chronic pain? The best example I can think of is my aunt, who unfortunately has MS, and she has a lot of low back pain, and she also actually had a cyst pressing on here. The cyst is actually actively pressing. So with the touch points, her low back pain went away, but not this. Okay, it's not going to take away all pain, but don't forget that pain is perception based, right? That's why anesthesia works. Okay, um, so if you, and depressed people feel more intense pain. So there are psychological states, and when you're in, when you're stressed out, you actually, you perceive more pain, even if it's physical. And just like when I ask you, hey, come up, and where do you feel it? <laughs> feel it here, I feel it here, or my muscles tense up. A lot of pain is modulated by the stress response system, and this is why EMDR treats phantom limb pain. Everybody know what phantom limb pain is? No arm, but I can still feel this in my arm. I can still feel pain in my arm. How is that possible? It's a memory trace of pain. It's real. You're really feeling that, even though there's no way that could be happening. Okay, and that's not because someone's schizophrenic. It happens all the time. Okay, um, I had a friend the other day talking about. Um, 
having a, it's mastitis, it's a breast infection from breastfeeding, and I had that, and I actually felt a sharp pain. That's phantom limb pain, okay? My brain was just remembering that. You can get rid of that, and a lot of pain is phantom limb pain, actually. So I get really excited when my patients are in my office, and we're doing processing, and they'll go, I'm getting a headache, and I'm like, yes! Because they're processing their stress, they're getting a headache, that means as soon as they're done, they're not gonna get headaches anymore. How, how is it? There is a difference in your back. So it was a four, and now how is it? A three. Okay, so give it a little more time. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The, they're called touch points, and the website is, and I don't know, do we have anything in the Scottsdale office? Do we have those cards, or did I have them all at the... Okay. So um, they're called touch points, and I can pass these around with the website on them, if you'd like, and some cards, so can, can you just, like, yep. yeah, thanks. Do you want me to pass okay. them up? Yeah, that'd be great. Dom will come around and, and pass those around, um, and, and then you can look, and all the research, a lot of the research is on there as well, and you can take a look at that, yes. Did you come up with these? The question is, did I come up with these, and the answer is yes, I did. Yes, good question. So, and thank you for doing that work. So she works in Nepal, kids who have been trafficked and often have HIV. And so, thank you for doing that work. Um, it's rewarding, isn't it? But it's really, really hard. And the question is that they don't always have a cell phone. Um, the version that, that the therapists usually use has an app in Western, you know, in our, in our thing. And also, but we have a new product, it's basic. So those, what I'm showing you is Touchpoints Original. Touchpoints basics are out right now. There's no app. They're infrared. So push one, push another one, and they're on. And um, the price point on those is lower. The um, originals are $240 for a set, and then I'm giving you coupons for $40 off. And the basics are $135 for the set. They come in cool colors. And if you're um, doing some of those things, just reach out, and I can, we can, um, you can work with you on some of that if you're doing that work. Yes. The ones I had in my hand are the originals. And the basics look the same, they're just in colors. Um, they're either gray or pink or blue or whatever. They look very, very similar. Um, and if you're using them in, the th in therapy, as in the therapeutic context, you're gonna want the originals because then you can just get the therapist app and use them on your patients and you can have them for yourselves. But for special ed classrooms, a lot of children with autism are wearing them all day long, okay? And so you don't want, a, everyone to have to have a smartphone and pair them with their Bluetooth. So in the classroom situations, or if you're doing group therapy and you want everybody to have them, the basics are, are what, we, what we created for that. And there was quest other questions over? Is there, is there any adjustments that are done to these once you do get these units? Are, the question is, are there any adjustments? And what, what do you mean? Like, like the frequency? Or yes. Do you uh, calibrate them? Do you monitor yep. Yes, yeah, so the question is, are there adjustments? And um, the, the app here, there's frequency, intensity, and overlap. And so you're going to feel this change, OK? Feel that? So you can just dial it down. There's also presets. There's a preset for sleep, focus, craving, calm, performance, and anger. How about the ones without the app? The ones without the app don't have all of this. They have three settings and they correspond to three of the presettings on here. And th these settings are based on midpoints, but there's a broad range of effectiveness, so the basics cover, will cover like 80, 90 percent of, of, what, of what this can cover. How are you now, by the way? My neck and back are relaxing. Your neck and back are relaxing? It's amazing. It's amazing, she says. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Does anybody else want to try these? All right. I don't know how much time we have. What time do we have? Four minutes. Okay, let me take a few more questions, and then I'll stay, and you can, um, we can, uh, the question, yes. Yeah, coming up. Are they covered by insurance? They're not covered by insurance. If we're using them from my clinics, you can use HSA accounts for them, but right now they're not covered by insurance. You think of something stressed? Are you stressed right now? Oh, yeah. Okay, there you go. If someone's not stressed, by the way, like I went to a yoga festival, 
And everybody was like, woo, let me hold them. And I'm like, you're probably not going to feel a difference. But I was actually surprised that sometimes they do because they're like, oh, but now I'm stressed that I'm not going to make my next class. And I'm like, okay, here. And they're like, oh, that's much better. I'm like, and that's ironic. You're less stressed, but I just, you know, took 20 seconds. Yes, back here. Yeah, so the, stud, the question is, do you, people who eat to regulate themselves, are there any studies of bilateral stim or EMDR? Yes. There's a feeling state addiction protocol in EMDR that you can use. Um, the issue with using that for obesity is, is somebody just have a couple of situations and foods, or is it just sort of they're compulsive in general? So if they're compulsive in general, our treatment plan for that is we do neurofeedback first, we use touch points for them at home, and then we do the EMDR, feeling state addiction protocol, and that also works for alcoholism. And um, don't lynch me for AA people, but um, you, they actually go back to controlled drinking successfully. I know, I'm sorry, I know, it's a paradigm change. I'm not saying that I, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm um, advocating, but I'm saying that I've, I've actually seen that, it's not a unicorn. And the, but when you desense and when you stabilize certain brain networks, the addictive brain networks, and they don't have the cravings and they don't do that, and you do the EMDR, see, when do people relapse? If somebody is addicted and they're 30 years sober, okay, and what, when do they relapse? It's when their dad dies, right? Or when their wife leaves them, or when something major happened. That's a nervous system issue. But if I've wiped out that trauma in EMDR, and then something negative happens, they're not, they're not likely, to, they're not as prone to relapse because anybody's susceptible to relapse once things are embedded in their memory networks, just like I'm susceptible to phantom limb pain once I've had an illness or chronic pain. Anyone else? Yes. So the question is, have they used it with migraines and prevention or their research? Um, we're doing research right now at the University of Ulm in Germany on pain and um, headaches and migraines may be a part of that, but we're, we're just we're refining the research design right now. So it's in the works. Yeah. But with EMDR, the EMDR therapist, can you cure headaches and migraines? They'll tell you yes. And they, and they can. They absolutely can. Um, because a lot of times, again, your brain is going to um, go into what it's done before. It's more likely to happen again. And so if you switch some of the memory networks around around that and it's not traumatizing then a lot of the somatic stuff just washes out so yeah um, I think a lot of EMDR therapists find that by act quite by accident too right any other questions peripheral biofeedback meaning no, we have, um, we have TDCS, uh, TACS, we have neurofeedback, we do the, heart math. Connecting the um, peripheral indicators for, to trigger the questions? No, but that would be a great conversation to have with Dom because he's asking about peripheral indicators and biofeedback and everything like that. Um, all right, any other questions before we? Yes. Yeah, do, okay, see the expiration on the coupon? Just ignore that. I reinstated it. For you, but I didn't. We didn't have time to print up new new things, so it's it's not expired. Um, I will stay for any questions or anything you want to talk to me about. Thank you so much for spending the time here and with me today. I hope that you got something useful out of this. Thank you.